All right, let's go ahead and get started here. Let's start. Um, oh, hang on. I got the wrong lecture going. Give me a second. Want this one. You know, with the right date and all. All right, now let's go. I thought while everybody's getting logged in here, start with chemistry meme. Periodic table seen by an organic chemist. All that really matters is carbon. You need some others to live. Some of them are worth money. Probably most, most real organic chemists would take issue with the fact that magnesium is in the boring section because green yard reagents and all. But other than that, it's about how organic chemists view things. You got carbon, you've got carbon's little buddy. All right, with that in mind, we're going to compute, continue talking about carbon. Um, let's do a little bit of, of uh, review in terms of acidity. Um, the Actually, let's talk about the one from the test instead. Because that did not go the way I thought it would go. Uh, you may have noticed all of the exam grades are up. In general, you guys did pretty well. Um, I was actually a little surprised, though, at the acidity question. Um, granted, this is a lot of compounds, but we can make a few generalizations right off the bat. For starters, anything that has an acid group is going to be more acidic than anything that's an alcohol. Despite the fact that phenol has resonance, it's not it's um, not a carboxylic acid group, and so it's not going to be as acidic. So these are going to be one, two, and three, the ones I circled in red. The question is just in what order. And most of you figured out that the ones attached to a benzene ring are going to be more acidic than the one attached to cyclohexane. So we can definitely put a three there because of the acids, that's gonna be the least acidic. When it comes to these others though, the key thing to look for was that a hydroxyl and alcohol is an electron donating group. And electron donating groups make things less acidic because more electron density means it's going to hold on to that hydrogen tighter. So benzoic acid would be the most acidic. And this is salicylic acid is the common name for that one. Salicylic acid would be less acidic, both of them more acidic than, than cyclohexane carboxylic acid. And then we just have to decide four and five. And just as before, resonance makes things more acidic, being able to resonate that charge is gonna make it um, the phenol more acidic than cyclohexanol. So those two got switched on a lot of, of your uh, tests. But as I said, other than, other than that, you guys didn't really make any systematic errors. There were not, um, people didn't in general make the same error um, repeatedly other than <clears throat> um, a number of you missed the fact that 
that's an sp3 carbon so you said that it was this was an aromatic compound just when it was non-aromatic you can't resonate all the way in that ring it's not aromatic yeah i think that's all that i really wanted to discuss Ah, yes. On this one, um, in general, you folks did pretty well. Um, the key that I was looking for on the explanations, though, is that if you draw a resonance structure where the right, where the left hand ring structure has, um, has a negative charge and the right hand ring structure has a positive charge, then both of the rings individually are aromatic at the same time. Because when you add up all of the pi bonds and, and electrons, so if you have one that looks like A negative charge here, pi bond, pi bond. And then on the other side, we would wind up with a positive charge on one of the carbons. You count up, and I'm actually, I'm missing a pi bond there. What did I do? Um, So we left that one where it was, that moved over, that moved over. Oh, it was putting it. So hang on. I can, there we go. When you draw these resonance structures, you can wind up drawing resonance structures. That's the one for part B, where you've got three uh, pairs of pi electrons on the left-hand ring and three pairs of pi electrons on the right-hand ring. And every resonance structure you can draw that does that um, puts the negative on the left-hand side and the positive on the right-hand side. And that makes each of these each of these ring structures aromatic on their own, as well as having the entire ring structure be aromatic. So this is a very stable resonance structure despite having charges because you make two other aromatic rings at the same time. And that applies that to down below as well to the other example. You can't really do this if you have two six-sided rings linked, but if you have a five-sided ring and a seven-sided ring, then the way the, the math works out, you are gonna wind up with the extra electrons on the five-sided ring compared to the seven-sided ring. And if you try to draw it the other direction, you wind up drawing things that are anti-aromatic. If you try to put the negative charge on the right-hand side, you're gonna wind up with four pairs of electrons on the right-hand ring and two pairs of electrons on the left-hand ring. So that'd make both of them anti-aromatic. So the asymmetry does play a key role there um, in our rules of, of aromaticity, Huckel's rule as well. Uh, any other questions about the test at this point? I didn't give you guys super, super detailed feedback because it's hard to do that on Canvas when I'm trying to grade things quickly, um, but I'm more than willing to let you know. Um, I have it broken down by, by section. If you wanna see your score by section, just let me know and I'll, I'll email it to you. All right, let's do some practice. So these are mostly dealing with 
um, acid derivatives. So go ahead and give it give it a go. See what you can remember from Tuesday's lecture. You know, it's a lot of volume. But remember, look what your nucleophile is. Look what your leaving group will be and see what you can do. All right, so these first two, or the top two, I should say, both reduction reactions. If you, have, if you see something with a hydride that you don't recognize, um, there's a pretty good chance it's gonna be one of those selective reductions. So in this case, we wind up reducing an ester uh, to an aldehyde, and the reaction stops there. One on the left is not a selective reduction with the excess lithium aluminum hydride. It's going to turn everything all the way to an alcohol. Um, let's look at C next because then that'll help us answer B. So C is our way to turn a uh, an amide or an acid into an acid chloride. Remember, so the mechanism was 
basically you wind up with your with the chlorine attaching to make a tetrahedral intermediate. Um, so your your initial product um, is just going to be the acid chloride. So then up above, we have an acid turned into an acid chloride followed by an amine. So, so we're going to turn the acid into an acid chloride and then turn it into the amide. The first step would be the same product here. Second step, got methyls all over the place. Um, but you're just going to go in and replace the chloride that you made with the nitrogen, leave the two carbons on the nitrogen, who wind up with a NN dimethyl, actually be NN33 tetramethyl butanamide. So we wouldn't split up um, the dimethyl into, or the tetramethyl into two different dimethyls for that name as well. Um, even though we have them just like having the methyls on a different carbon, we still put all of our methyl groups together and then give locations for each of them. So N, N, three, three, tetramethyl. Butanamide. All right, an alcohol and an acid anhydride. We're just going to wind up attaching the alcohol. We're going to make an ester and the carboxylate ion. So we're going to attach. the benzene ring on one side of the ester. So we'd have a phenyl acetate be one of our products or phenyl ethanoate. And then we still have leftover acetate as well. Right, because what's left over when we break apart this acid anhydride, we're going to attach the alcohol one side and then the acetate ion still left over on the other side. So we have another amine, it's another secondary amine. It's got a much larger group attached to it, um, but reaction doesn't change. We have an, an acid chloride with an amine, we're gonna make an amine. As long as there's one hydrogen at least on our amine, we're gonna be able to turn that into the amide. Um, and incidentally, I believe that this is, diphenhydramine is the name of this molecule. If I'm remembering correctly, which is Benadryl. Although I seem to recall that the last time I looked it up, I had that wrong. So I want to double check. Diphenylamine. So diphenhydramine is something else. So that's diphenylamine, which is the way it should be. And that's so that's a fungicide, not Benadryl. So diphenhydramine still has the two phenyl groups, but we have this other group in between. It's a little bit more complicated.
So diphenylamine, this is why we looked it up. I assumed when I looked at the packaging on Benadryl and it said diphenhydramine that it was this structure. These silly pharmaceutical chemists don't know how to name things properly. It drives me nuts. All right. So our product here would just wind up being, we're attaching the nitrogen where the chlorine was. And so then our product would be the NN diphenyl acetamide or NN diphenyl uh, ethanamide. And then we have everybody's favorite ring opening reactions. Um, this one's actually not so bad. The smaller rings are actually easier to keep track of what's happening here. We're going to be breaking the ester. When you expose an ester to an acid, you're always going to hydrolyze it and turn it into the alcohol and the acid. We're going to be breaking it apart there. The part that has the carbonyl turns into an acid. The part, the oxygen that was attached to the carbonyl just becomes an, an alcohol. And we wind up making salicylic acid that we talked about from a, the acidity question. Um, if you take this and you turn this into an acetate ester, if you expose this to uh, acetic anhydride, that's a good one. Let's do that. If we take this molecule and expose it to acetic anhydride, the acid side won't won't really react because you're not you're not going to make another anhydride um, from this anhydride. You wind up taking this and you wind up at to making an ester out of the alcohol group. So that stays the same. We added an acetate group, make it an acetate ester. Um, that's this is now known as acetyl salicylic acid. Which is better known as aspirin. Right, so that was the reaction that you guys were, were simulating for that lab where you had to, to workshop the reaction conditions and um, figure out how to maximize production of aspirin, of acetyl salicylic acid. That, that's a really classic reaction because salicylic acid is both pretty harmless and cheap. Um, it's found naturally in willow bark. Um, if you take that and just expose it to acetic anhydride, you make aspirin. Aspirin has all sorts of nice properties for learning how to, how to work in a lab. It recrystallizes easily. Um, you get high yields from this reaction. Um, the crystals are nice and, and white and fluffy, which makes for a good, easy testing of melting points. Plus it's a pharmaceutical compound, which is always interesting, keeps people interested. Um, and now we finally covered the reaction for that. It's usually one of the reactions you do like the second week of o OCHEM 1, you make aspirin just for like practice using lab techniques, but we don't actually cover the reactions for it until almost all the way through the year. Um, incidentally, make another plug for um, ethnobotany as a, as a practice. Ethnobotany is the, um, the use of science to study 
um, traditional remedies of various cultures, various ethnic groups. Um, because a lot of times, if there's something to it scientifically, there's a compound that we can take and um, purify and turn it into a, a more predictable medicine. Um, so Native Americans used to drink willow bark tea for headaches and as a pain relief, because willow bark willow bark has salicylic acid in it, which is a mild um, is a mild pain reliever. Um, and when they did the extraction with any sort of vinegar, then they wound up making small amounts of acetyl salicylic acid. So ethnobotany is this is an is the way we would go in there, look at, hey, this, this culture has this remedy of using willow bark tea. I wonder if there's anything in the willow bark tea that we could actually use. So it's the investigation of existing traditional remedies um, to see whether there's any, any scientific um, or pharmaceutical basis to them. Um, so that's you know, really, really prevalent. There was a lot of, of that happening um, in this, the 70s and 80s with um, uh, in the Amazon, especially because there are so many new plants that had pharmaceutical properties um, that were discovered in the in the 60s, 70s and 80s in the Amazon. Um, of course, the most famous of those is DMT, but there's a lot of others from from that period that wound up um, being a what we call a lead compound being like a starting place for various pharmaceuticals. And I think my video rose up. There we go. All right. Last one here. We've got an ester that we're going to expose to an acid, which is going to turn it, take it and turn it into the carboxylic acid, we're going to hydrolyze that ester. Then we're going to follow that up with exposing the acid to an acid chloride. So the acid would just look like we've already drawn it for one of the others. Then when we turn around and expose that to an acid chloride, acid chlorides are going to take um, you have a really good leaving group, a really reactive group on the acid chloride. So we're going to take this and make it into an anhydride because we have our um, acetyl chloride on the other side. We're going to wind up losing an HCl molecule and joining these two acid derivatives. So our final product would look like look like that. So essentially, the only way that we can reliably make an acid anhydride is starting from the acid chloride and then exposing it to an acid. Yeah, Adam. Yeah, Sean, I have a question about numbers or letter C. Um, if you expose a SOCl2 to an amide, doesn't it make a nitrile? We're getting ahead of ourselves if, if uh, that is the case. Um, let's, let's double check that. Yeah, I think it's the uh, acid that turns into a chloride. That's a good catch if that's the case. And you sound like you're well prepared for that. So you're probably right. Um, so taking an acid and turning it into, yeah, exposing to SOCl2 turns it into the yeah, acid chloride. Uh, preparation of nitriles. Yep, you are absolutely right. Taking a, um, taking an amide and exposing it to SO. Cl2 gives us the nitrile, not the uh, acid chloride. 
which then we would have that nitrile and expose it to this. So we're, we're nitrile is what we're talking about today. So we'll go through um, and say what happens to the nitrile after that in more detail in a second. But in general, if you take a nitrile and you expose it to What was that night? What's the dimethylamine? Um, that should be on here. Well, we'll talk about that when we get there because I don't have it prepped and it's slipping my mind right now. So first step would just be to make the night trial. Oh, this one only had one step. There we go. I'm trying to, to find a reaction that doesn't that, that we don't need to right now. For yeah. C, we make yeah. nitrile. For B, we make the acid chloride followed by the amide. Yeah, it seems a little ahead so, of itself. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and and actually that's worth mentioning too that on the test, there was one question that gave everybody that one reaction that everybody struggled with um, <clears throat> was uh, this one right here, um, where you made an ester and then exposed it to amide ion, NH2 with a negative charge. Nobody really knew what to do with that, um, probably because it essentially just undoes making the ester. You start by making the ester with the acid with the uh, acetic anhydride and the alcohol, and then you undo it and you turn it into making an amide. Um, so I was just, I was asking about two sequential reactions. They weren't necessarily building on each other. One essentially undid the other in this case. So the final product, the intermediate in this case would look like there, the phenyl, oxygen, so the, the phenyl acetate, and then when you expose that to the to the amide, your nitrogen's just gonna attach here and you break that off. And so you wind up um, going back to, to the deprotonated phenol, essentially. And the acetamide. Everybody, tried to figure out <clears throat> how they could do some sort of aromatic substitution reaction um, from there. But really all I was looking for was that you're taking, taking the ester that you just made and breaking it apart. Um, and I think part of that was just that we hadn't spent as much time on the acid derivatives yet um, at the time of the test. So it was not as, as obvious. Um, it would not, go through an elimination addition or any of the other nucleophilic aromatic reactions because we didn't have the right conditions for those. So that benzene ring was tempting because it was big when you drew it and it seemed like you should be able to do something with that to put an, an NH2 on the benzene ring, but it didn't have a good leaving group. So it wasn't elimination addition and it wasn't the nucleophilic substitution because you didn't have a good leaving group either um, for that one as well. So the only thing left to react was the carbonyl carbon. It wasn't meant to be a trick question. It was meant to be a layup, but that happens sometimes. Um, when I write these tests, sometimes what feels like a layup in my head winds up being tricky for you. Um, oh, is it the, um, the one that always was uh, very, Concerning me is on a gen chem test, I asked people to convert 40 degrees Fahrenheit into Celsius using the Fahrenheit equals 1.8 Celsius plus 32. Um, and if you plug in 40 degrees Fahrenheit, you get the temperature in Celsius is also 40 degrees. And I thought that was just like a nifty little piece of trivia that everybody would be excited to learn about. Um, but on a test, um, everybody just freaked out and thought they forgot how to do algebra because they kept getting the same answer out um, that they started with. So I always try to account for things like that when I write the tests, things that I think are easy or cool are not always 
uh, what you guys are going to catch on to. All right. So if we're trying to make nitriles, here's the one that we were just talking about. Um, the one of the simplest and the one we've actually seen before is just do an SN2 reaction where you've got cyanide as your nucleophile. You got cyanide as your nucleophile. You're just going to come in, and it's a pretty strong nucleophile. Um, it's just going to come in and displace any good leaving group. So works the best when we're using a halide as our leaving group. But really, any you know, if we have have this protein, if we did uh, this with an alcohol and cyanic acid, sorry, hydrocyanic acid. Um, the acid would protonate the alcohol, make the water a good leaving group, and then you could have cyanide acting as a, as a nucleophile there too. So you see it most often with the bromides or chlorides, but there are other cases where our cyanide can act as a nucleophile as well. Um, and this, remember that these nitriles are technically, they're kind of considered acid derivatives because the carbon has the same oxidation state as all the ox, um, acid derivatives. If we look at, say, acetic acid, the carbonyl carbon has three oxygen bonds to it, right? And one carbon carbon bond. Well, a nitrile has three carbon nitrogen bonds. So it's still three bonds to elements that are more electronegative than it is. So we wind up with the same oxidation state on that carbon, despite the fact that it doesn't really look the same and the reactions are significantly different. Um, but it, it, having the same oxidation state does mean that we can convert back and forth without too much trouble. We don't have to go through a whole redox reaction. We're not oxidizing or reducing anything. We just need to rearrange the bonds to go from a nitrile to an acid derivative or vice versa. All right, so SN2 reactions where you have cyanide as the nucleophile, that's the that's probably the simplest way, but that does wind up adding a carbon as well to whatever our, our um, starting material was. So from a synthesis point of view, we need to pay attention to that. We can't use this as our way of making a nitrile if we are already happy with our carbon structure. We're already happy with our carbon structure and we don't, we either need to find a way to cut off a carbon and then add it back again, which is probably harder than finding a different reaction. Because if we can turn something into an amide, we can use the reaction we just talked about on the last slide. SOCl2 is a very good at dehydrating um, and will turn the amide into a nitrile. We basically pull the oxygen off because remember we talked about how stable those sulfur oxygen bonds are. Um, and so sulfur oxygen bonds being so stable, it basically steals the oxygen off of the amide. And so to, to counteract that, <clears throat> you need to get rid of the two hydrogens on the nitrogen and you make two more carbon nitrogen pi bonds. All right, so and the, the mechanism is down here. Um, you start once again with the oxygen pi bonds attaching to the sulfur, and then the amide lone pair bumps over to keep that carbon's um, valence shell full. And then we wind up deprotonating to making this, this almost, almost like an oxime intermediate or um, imine intermediate. And then we just do it one more time. <clears throat> Once we have a, a lone pair on the nitrogen again, the lone pair goes over, or sorry, the um, they just have it drawn as the bonds bond between the nitrogen and the hydrogen moves over to make carbon nitrogen triple bond. Um, and you wind up with your oxygen leaving. All right, so again. The two mechanisms we have with SOCl2 from this chapter are the trickiest as far as the mechanism. They're, the, they're not that tricky, but they're different. The rest of these are pretty much all the same, right? 
make your tetrahedral intermediate, leaving group leaves, and you reform the carbonyl, maybe with some proton transfer steps if you're in an acidic environment. But the two mechanisms for SOCl2 were the ones that were a little bit different. They're still kind of similar to each other, but they're um, worth paying attention to. Uh, let's, let's do, we only have two more slides of new material and then the rest of today is just practice, um, with, uh, and finishing up the chapter. And since, um, since we did just take a midterm, we don't need to push it that hard. So let's talk about the next two reactions and their mechanisms, and then we'll come back and practice them after break. So once we make a nitrile, we only really have two reactions to make a nitrile. Cyanide is a nucleophile or dehydration of an amide. Once we have a nitrile, we can hydrolyze nitriles just like we can um, hydrolyze esters or anything else. If we expose it to, um, to enough acid and heat, we can turn it back to being the amide. And if we keep adding more acid and heat, we can turn it all the way back to the carboxylic acid. So this is basically just, just abusing Le Chatelier's principle again. Add enough H3O plus and heat, and you can get it to go back to the other direction just by adding so much reactant that you flood that side of the equilibrium expression. Uh, and the same, we can do the same if we, um, use hydroxide instead, <clears throat> it'll also go that way too. Just like we could hydrolyze an ester with either acid or with the base, we can do the same thing with the nitriles. And strong enough acid or a strong enough base um, will we'll turn it back to the carboxylic acid. So really, we can we could set this up and do this indefinitely. We could take an acid, convert it to an amide, convert it to a nitrile, and then turn it all the way back to an acid as many times as we want. Switching back and forth between these, um, I mean, you're gonna lose a little bit every time that you have to get take your product and purify it, but there's nothing that's preventing any of these acid derivative reactions from, from going backwards. Right, it's all just control of the equilibrium. Um, Grignard reagents will also wind up uh, reducing a nitrile. You wind up adding an R group. You know, this, this nitrile carbon is a pretty good target for a nucleophile, right? Because you've got that nitrogen pulling all the electron density. So a strong nucleophile. Um, like a Grignard reagent or a hydride can come in there and attach to that carbon. So if you do a Grignard reagent, you wind up turning it into this um, imine-like intermediate, which then if we expose it to um, water and acid, we'll wind up converting it. It'll reduce that imine or it'll um, reverse that imine formation reaction and turn it back to being a carbonyl. Um, so we can also take the um, nitriles and convert it back to convert to a ketone um, by going through this process by using a Grignard reagent, um, which which means essentially we can treat this nitrile a lot like we would be treating a. Um, and I might, it's really not that different. The steps are a little different, but it's not that different than having the imine where we had So remember that functional group? My tablet's writing is a little bit wonky today. Um, but back from chapter 18, 19. Um, when we were talking about aldehydes and ketones, we could always take this and just chop it and turn it back to the carbonyl. This, this uh, using a Grignard reagent on a nitrile basically gives us another way we can do that. Uh, 
And then last but not least, we've seen this reaction before. If you expose this uh, to excess lithium aluminum hydride, we wind up reducing the carbon. And so this is actually, this is very similar to what we see when we expose an acid to lithium aluminum hydride. In the case of an acid, we can't get rid of that last carbon oxygen bond. So we turn it into an alcohol, right? In this case, we can't get rid of the last nitrogen carbon bond. So it turns from a nitrile into an amine. Right, but still very similar, right? If it was the acid. We'd be converting it to. To the primary alcohol. With the nitrile, we're converting it to the primary amine when we do that. Um, which is also pretty similar if I'm remembering my. This is the one I wanted, the amide. Yeah, so it does the same thing as the amide does. And amide will do the same thing when you expose it to excess lithium aluminum hydride. In both cases, you keep the carbon nitrogen bond and you replace um, the other two bonds with hydrides. All right, so the hydrolysis reaction of nitriles. So Grignard reagents, the mechanism is kind of shown. It's, it's not too tricky. Um, if you then take this and expose it to water with acid, we have a, a mechanism where you wind up with the water acting as a nucleophile and you wind up protonating this. And then you wind up needing to protonate it again. But we wind up, it's basically the same mechanism we saw back in chapter 19 with, with um, imines, right? Hydrolysis of, hydrolysis of an imine looked very similar. Um, to this mechanism. So that's not really a new reaction. And same with the reduction of the nitriles. Anytime you've got lithium aluminum hydride, your first step is always going to be hydride attaches to the carb to a partial positive. And then so you're going to wind up making an intermediate that looks like this again. And then, but with excess hydride, you're just going to do it again. And you're going to wind up breaking both of the pi bonds to replace them with carbon hydrogen bonds. Right, so the mechanisms for those two are pretty straightforward. We've seen them before anyway. The, the hydrolysis of nitriles looks a little different on the surface. You start by protonating the nitriles lone pair which gives you nitrogen with a positive charge. And so then water can come in and act as a nucleophile. And like I said, you wind up making this intermediate again, this carbon nitrogen double bond when, when um, water comes in and acts as a nucleophile. And then if we keep, so it's just, it's a series of proton transfers is really, is really all it is. Once we get down here, now we're to the amide. And then if we are going to continue to hydrolyze it to go all the way to the acid, we have the mechanism to go from an amide to an acid. It was just more of the same. OH, the H2O acts as a nucleophile here. Probably a proton transport under acidic conditions first. We'll wind up adding a proton there. Right, so again, that mechanism we've seen before as well. So the, this one looks a little different on the surface, but the steps are the same. A bunch of proton transfers and a nucleophilic attack. Um, and then you wind up moving the pi bonds from being carbon nitrogen pi bonds to carbon oxygen pi bond to make it into the amide. And once we're back to being in our mind, we're back in a, in a um, functional group that we can then 
that we have a bunch of reactions for. We can take the amide, turn it into the acid. From the acid, we can go to the acid chloride, and then we're back to being able to get to any of our other acid derivatives. All right, so it takes a little bit of work to go uphill in energy. We have to mess with Le Chatelier's principle, make sure that we're making things that are stable along the way, and our yields might not be great if we're trying to take a nitrile and convert it all the way back to an acid chloride. Our yields might not be great because we're going uphill in energy, but we're not going that far uphill. So it's still doable. We can do this in a lab if we push on Le Chatelier's principle and get measurable amount of product. Um, some reactions in OCHEM are so downhill in energy, they're essentially irreversible. That's not the case with these. These are so close in energy that with, with a little bit of work and creative thinking, we can actually undo any of these acid um, derivative reactions that we've seen. All right, let's take a break. And we'll come back and we'll practice these. I'll leave this up. Um, let's come back at five after. And we will practice using these, do some synthesis problems.
All right, let's go ahead and keep working on these. So here's a set of, excuse me, uh, more, more um, practice with these acid derivatives. Remember, look for if it's a reduction reaction versus a substitution. And if it's a reduction reaction, remember that carbon nitrogen bonds are more stable than carbon oxygen bonds. So the carbon nitrogen bonds are more likely to stick around if you're treating something that has both carbon and, or oxygen and nitrogen in it. All right, so give these a go and then we'll go through them in a minute. This is what I get for not paying attention when I put that up there. Looks like I already did that. Um, the answers are already up there, and I believe they're all correct. Um, I must have done this last year when we were doing this. We've gone through and forgot to delete these. All right, so as mentioned, for A, we're just going to turn it into the amine. And it was already already on there, but now but we'll go through the logic for each of them too. So we're going to wind up making the same compound, but as an amine, we're just basically going to pull the oxygen off, replace it with hydrides. Acid chloride with an amine, or in this case, ammonia, the original amine. Um, is just going to turn it into the amide structure. If you take an amide and then expose it to enough acid and heat, we can get it to go back the other direction and turn it back into the carboxylic acid. So it'd wind up with cyclohexane carboxylic acid for C. Once again, we've got another carbon nitrogen group being exposed to excess lithium aluminum hydride. So we'll get the same product for A on this one as well. We're going to fully reduce that carbon as much as we can. We can't pull the nitrogen all the way off. So we're going to wind up making the, the amine from the nitrile. So some of these multi-step ones worth going over the 
individual steps. So step one on B is we have a cyanide and a good leaving group. So we're gonna just do a nucleophilic substitution to make the nitrile. Then if we expose a nitrile to a Grignard reagent, followed by H3O plus, we turn it into a ketone. We're gonna add the R group and break one of the pi bonds. We wind up making this intermediate which then can get hydrolyzed and turned into the carbonyl. So our final product here oops, be that ketone. This is the point in the, in, the, in the class where, like I said, you guys have seen pretty much all of the tricks with a few exceptions when it comes to mechanisms. So all of the individual steps can make sense. It's just a matter of, it gets kind of tricky to keep everything going in your head and uh, keep everything straight to make sure you don't miss anything somewhere along the way, All right? So the net result of this series of reactions is we, we wind up adding a carbon and turning the bromine into a nitrile, then a ketone. Like I said, each individual step is really simple. Right? Step one's SN2. We've been doing that for six months at this point. Step two is a Grignard reagent. We've seen those forever too, but Grignard reagents with nitriles is new. And the net result of turning the nitrile into a ketone is a little bit unexpected, even though the steps make sense. So just be careful and pay attention to your notes um, when, you're, when you're working on these problems, because this seems like a big leap to be able to add two carbons, one of them as a carbonyl, when we're starting with just the bromide. So just make sure you're breaking it down into the individual steps. Take your time. You know, make sure you've got your bookmarks in your textbook or your or you know photocopies of your reaction summaries. Print it out um, so that you have a good you know, reference to look at. Um, a nitrile plus ethyl magnesium bromide. So another Grignard reagent, we're adding an ethyl group here and we're following it up with H3O plus. So we're turning it into the ketone again. So after steps one and two, the nit what was the nitrile carbon turns into a ketone and we added an ethyl to it. Then we follow that up with lithium aluminum hydride in water. Lithium aluminum hydride takes a ketone, turns it into an alcohol. The water is just the proton source for the alcohol. And if we just take a nitrile and just expose it to H3O plus and plenty of heat, we get the same result as, we, as if we did that with an amide, because we're going to start by the, the overall process here is the first step is it takes the nitrile and converts it to an amide. Because you start with by protonating the nitrogen then water acts as a nucleophile to attach to the nitrile carbon. 
then you wind up with a bunch of proton transfer steps to turn the um, the intermediate, which looks like our intermediate looked like this positive charge on the on the water there do a couple proton transfer steps and move some pi electrons around and you wind up switching it to the, the amide then if we continue to have excess acid and more heat the amide will then continue to do the same thing we'll wind up with um, protonating the amide so we would get NH3 with a positive charge there. Water can come in and attach, or sorry, not attach there. The carbonyl carbon, wind up making a tetrahedral intermediate. With a couple of proton transfer steps, you can wind up with the nitrogen taking its electrons and reforming the carbonyl, just like all the rest of the, the acid derivative reaction. So that tetrahedral intermediate would look like so we're in acidic conditions, so we need to make sure that If, if anything has a charge, it's a positive charge. And realistically, we probably wouldn't have two positive charges at the same time. We would have gone through one proton transfer step first. I guess we kind of have to. Yeah, we probably would go through a proton transfer step where we convert this bottom water into an OH before we protonate the nitrogen. Um, but it's, I'm not going to be picky about that. If we're in acidic conditions, drawing it like this is fine. And then your last proton transfer steps look something like this. And I'm drawing kind of a lot of them at the same time, but the net result would be protonated acid, which then we would just kick that last proton off to get to our final product. So our final product for this one would just be the cyclohexane carboxylic acid. There's a reason that everything it seems like it's catalyzed by acid in organic chemistry. Um, and that's because with enough proton transfer steps, you can basically have anything happen, right? If you know where you're trying to go and you have enough protons around and can do enough proton transfer steps, you can kind of make it end up wherever you want um, once you get the hang of it. You know, it's it's a matter of knowing what's the most favorable product that it's going to make under these conditions kind of gives you the overall direction for where you're supposed to be doing these proton transfer steps. If we know that this, that D is gonna start out by turning to an amide and then an amide to a carboxylic acid, knowing those steps along the way tells us where we're gonna to need to do our proton transfer steps and where we're doing our nucleophilic attacks. Um, and it does take a fair bit of practice to be able to see that. All right, so here's our reaction summary for this chapter. There's a lot of reactions we talked about. Um, all of the boxed functional groups um, can all be converted between, between them fairly, fairly easily with the exception of 
these ones in the bottom, those are all reduction reactions to make those. All these ones in the top, you're not changing the oxidation state. So those are all of our acid derivatives in blue. And from the acid derivatives, we can get to either a class two carbonyl, an alcohol, or an amine, depending on where we're starting. But going back and forth between any of the blue ones um, takes a little bit of practice. And sometimes we have to lean on Le Chatelier a little bit, but we can go back and forth between any of those. So knowing your functional groups winds up being really important. Um, and then just recognizing what's my nucleophile and what kind of, of acid derivative is that making or recognizing that you've got a reduction happening. Right? And I think now at this point, we have enough experience that we can actually make sense of that subway map um, that we've used in the past. It's basically a way, it has a, the conditions to convert between pretty much any um, functional group. And if you look at the bottom section, starting from the carboxylic acid, these are all of our acid derivatives on the right-hand side. So this is a decent review of how of other ways we can, um, how all of these different functional groups sort of interact with each other. And they use, this is from the UK, so they use slightly different nomenclature. And then they, they're, for some of these, like for, to get in a carboxylic acid, we only talked about um, SOCl2, but you can also use SClO2 or um, phosphorus trichloride or phosphorus pentachloride. Um, so it, some of the reagents are a little bit different, but just as a way of remembering, oh yeah, I can convert from an acid anhydride to a carboxylic acid. Um, it's not a bad way to do that. And we actually do have some ways, we didn't even talk about this. There is a way to go straight from a carboxylic acid to an acid anhydride. We did not cover this, um, this mechanism. So our approach would be take it carboxylic acid, turn it to an acyl chloride. And then from there, we can get anywhere in the carboxylic acid region. Um, but just to show you that, you know, they can be designed so that they look a little bit better, but this style of fairly complicated um, reactions to get from between different functional groups is a pretty common way to think about synthesis and OCHEM in general when we get to this state where we've got so many mechanisms and reactions kicking around in our heads. Um, having sort of a good summary for each of these chapters winds up being really important um, so that you can go back and get the specifics of each of them. So you don't do what I did at the beginning of class and mix up your SOC. Cl2 reaction of an amide versus an acid. All right. Let's see. I think this is the last slide for today. Um, so your quiz this weekend is going to be is pretty quick. Um, it's not getting as much into the reactions. It's more just talking about acidity and functional groups and recognizing functional groups. Um, so that should go pretty quickly, at least for the, the three of you who are here. Um, today, we've been talking about a lot of these functional groups. Um, and it's really one of those things, you know, knowing the vocabulary for this chapter winds up being pretty important because switching back and forth between and hydrides and chlorides and acids and amides. If you can't come up with the functional group, you know, quickly off the top of your head, it gets hard to keep up with a lot of these. Um, so make sure that you're feeling comfortable with the with the vocab when it comes to these functional groups. Um, 
and these so there's last these last two slides this slide are, is not too tricky these are all fairly straightforward um reactions because we're they're two-step synthesis these ones are a little bit trickier because you have some oxidation reduction happening in some of them um, so we'll go quickly through these and then spend a little bit more time on the next slide. If we want to take an ester and convert it to an acid chloride, let's consult our handy summary table. Ester is the right square in the middle here. If we want to turn that to an acid chloride, we don't really have a good direct route to go from an ester to an acid chloride. But if we take an ester and turn it to an acid, we can go to an acid chloride. So, and if you look at, at the arrows around acid chlorides, oops, only one of them has an arrow that points to the acid chloride. We only really have one reaction that makes an acid chloride. So knowing that we only have one reaction that can make our product here, first off, we're happy with the carbon skeleton structure. So we don't have to do anything tricky with that. Second, if we only, the only way we have of making an acid chloride is from the carboxylic acid. So we just need to find a way to take our ester and convert it to the acid. And then just a quick SOCl2 will convert that to the acid chloride. All right, so to go from an ester to an acid was just H3O plus and heat. And once we're in the acid and we want to go to the chloride, SOCl2. If we want to go from an acid to an amine, we need to add a nitrogen. So any reaction that will add a carbon nitrogen. If we can add a carbon nitrogen bond, then any of the reduction reactions we have will turn that nitrogen into an amine. So once again, if we consult our, um, our handy summary chart here, um, we can either make an amide or a nitrile. And then from there, they have the same conditions that are going to turn them into the amine. And there's not a direct arrow that goes from making a carboxylic acid to making an amide. But so you, you could do that in one step, but your yield is not going to be great. Um, to get the best yield, we would want to make the acid chloride first and then convert it to the amide. Um, however, if you just said the acid plus ammonia to make an amide and then exposing that to excess lithium aluminum hydride, that would, that would work. In fact, I'd wager that that other map that we had here, let's see, acid to an amide no, they don't have a direct line either from, from acid to the amide. Um, so it's going to go by way of the, of the acid chloride to the amide to the amine. So.
SOCl2 gets us the acid chloride, then excess NH3 gives us the amide. followed by excess lithium aluminum hydride. And if you're writing them like this, instead of showing the individual intermediates to make sure that you're putting your numbers there because we don't want to put all these things in there at the same time. If we tried to do all these reactions at the same time, God only knows what we would make. Um, but it would not be what we want in very good uh, yield if we tried to do all this at the same time. So just make sure that you have them numbered or show out the pathway. I didn't leave myself enough room on this slide to show out the pathways, but um, that's your way of making sure that you're actually getting where you say you're getting is to draw your intermediates out there as well. Ah. Acid anhydride to acid chloride. We only had one good way to make the acid chloride, and that went through the carboxylic acid. So we're going to start by hydrolyzing the acid anhydride, turning it to the acid, and then SOCl2. We're going to see with a lot of these, SOCl2 winds up being really important because if we can get to the acid chloride, we can get to anywhere else on that map pretty easily in a pretty small number of steps. And so H3O plus turn, gives us the acetic acid. SOCl2 gives us the acid chloride. Easy step one, two step synthesis for this one. An ester to an amide, or sorry, to an amine. We don't want to add any extra carbon, so we're not going to be using nitrile as a nucleophile or anything like that. So we're going to want to go through an amide intermediate. And just to reiterate, only good way of getting to an amide well, as, oh, I guess that we do have an ester. We can just expose straight to ammonia or any primary amine. We're going to get the amide. Then we can take that and reduce it to make the amine. So by double checking our, our uh, map here, saved us a step on our synthesis pathway, right? I was going to take this and go all the way to the acid chloride and then go to the amide. Um, but we actually do have ester to an amide as being a favorable enough reaction. We can use that. So expose it to ammonia. Excess lithium aluminum hydride. <clears throat> um, and you can see how if we started from something here, this is not our only subway style, subway map style um, path or um, re reaction re review we've had. This is going to be connected to all the other chapter reviews we've done, right? Um, 
for instance, if you can make a class two carbonyl, we had a whole list of reactions for class two carbonyls. They're going to be connected to this one. That was our, what, chapter 19, I think. We had a whole chapter on alcohol reactions, which was back a ways now, what, chapter 13 or 14, something last quarter. All right, so in all of those reactions, these are sort of the, the transfer stations that allow us to get to our, our reduction or our oxidation reactions are our transfer stations that allow us to get to whole other sections of our organic reaction web. Right, and so this is complicated enough remembering that then you have the other ones you have your blue system over here for for class two carbonyls then you've got your red system over there for alcohols next chapter after we do alpha carbon chemistry is going to be amines and so we're going to have a whole list of reactions for amines that we'd be able to connect to using this bottom react these bottom reactions right so it all does still fit together and this is why synthesis is so tricky um in general is because seeing some of these connections takes a lot of practice. It's a lot like talking to an organic synthesis, um, synthesis expert is a lot like talking to a native New Yorker who knows the subway system by heart, right? Because if I went to New York and I was trying to get from, I don't know, Harlem to Coney Island, I'm going to have to sit down with subway map and figure it out before I get on the subway, right? But somebody who's lived there their whole life, they know, oh, I've got to make this transfer over here, and then I can get on that line over there, and then I can take this, right? So it, why we keep coming back to this, why we started with simple synthesis, and now we're getting to the point where it's really hard to keep track of what's going on. All right, so there's three more synthesis reactions here. If we wanna go, if we just wanted to go from an acid to a alcohol, we could do that. But if we wanna add carbons at the same time, really secondary alcohols are the trickiest. Because if we if we wanted to make a primary alcohol, we could just use lithium aluminum hydride. If we wanted to make a tertiary alcohol, we could just use the Grignard reagent. But to make these a secondary alcohol, we need to do one of those selective reductions first, where we reduce it, but we stop it at one step. So the, the most common of those, so for A, the most common of those is our, is it lithium cuprate? Those were those Gilman reagents, usually written as R-C-U-L-I. They function like a Grignard reagent, but they will only go the first step. So if we did this with an ethyl group, um, where R is, then our first step here would be to turn that acid into a ketone. Right, and the way that I knew that that was a good first step here is I know I've got to add one R group to an acid, but I don't want to add two R groups. I want to fully reduce that acid, but not with two hydrides or two R groups. I want to add one R group and one hydride in order to make the secondary alcohol. So you have to start by either doing we could, there's two routes we could go. The other way we could do this would have been to, um, to use one of those um, selective hydride sources. So it was 
lithium aluminum OR three H. And that would have given us added one hydride. And kicked off an OH. So we would want to make them the aldehyde in that case. Either of those is a valid first step, because then we're going to follow it up with the other one. If we added the R group first, like we did for the red reaction, the next step is lithium aluminum hydride, which gets us to our product. If we went the blue route, our next step is we need to add our R group. So we could just use a Grignard reagent net now with an ethyl. So ethyl magnesium bromide. Will also get us to our product. So for these secondary alcohols, you have to do it in two steps because you need to add an hydride and an R group, but you can do that in either order. And realistically, in a lab, we would probably test both pathways. If we were in a production lab and we wanted to make it as, as efficient as possible, we would test both pathways and take whatever gave us the highest yield. If we were in a lab and we were trying this for the first time, we would take whatever was in the stock room. If we had magnesium bromide in the stock room, but we didn't have and lithium, um, but we didn't have um, copper, the uh, lithium cuprate to make the Gilman reagent. But it all depends on which of these reagents we have kicking around, or which reagents we could make on the fly in in lab. Which pathway we would take. Either one would give us some measurable results. If we want to take B is kind of a tricky one because we need to add a carbon and then we need to turn that carbon into um, into an ester. So adding this part is probably the easiest part because we could use acetate or acetic anhydride as a reagent to turn it into an ester as long as we can turn our starting material into, I'm putting it over here just so I don't put them on top of each other. If we can make, this is what's known as benzyl alcohol, um, where you put the OH on the benzylic position. So it's not phenol. The IUPAC name would be phenyl methanol. So to get to here, if we can get to here, then it's pretty easy to get to the final product. We just need to use a little acetic anhydride or acetyl chloride, either way, to make that ester. So how could we replace a bromine on a benzene ring with a carbon? winds up being the trickiest thing here, potentially. Any thoughts? I don't know. Uh, maybe something like an acid chloride would give you an extra carbon and a, maybe not the right path. If we had a strong enough nucleophile, we, we do have a good leaving group here, right? So we could do an elimination addition if we had a strong enough nucleophile. Um, and actually, elimination addition, we don't really need that strong of a nucleophile. We've only done it with hydroxide and amide. We could potentially do it with cyanide. But then we still wind up with a carbon nitrogen that we would need to then turn into an alcohol somehow. 
So that would get a little bit tricky. That starts getting pretty convoluted. There might be an easier way. I know that if we have a phenyl bromide, we can turn that into phenyl magnesium bromide just by exposing it to magnesium. And then we've got a Grignard reagent. If there, that might be a pathway potentially, then we would just need to expose it to formaldehyde, could make the, could do this, or some other, um, we, we have a, a pretty strong nucleophile that is a, an entire phenyl group, so maybe methyl iodide, then we wind up making, we would wind up making toluene, still might not be ideal because then we still have to find a way to turn that into an alcohol. Anything else seeming like it might be an option? No, I was going to say, I mean, you could then like radically brominate the, the toluene and then just switch it out with water, couldn't you? But that's not Yeah, we that could efficient. use NDS. We could use, so we could take the phenyl magnesium bromide, expose it to methyl iodide, gets us toluene. Which then with NBS gets us bromo toluene. And then with hydroxide, now we have a good leaving group there. We expose that to hydroxide. This is getting a little convoluted. There's probably a faster way because as soon as we get into the, so we're now sitting at one, two, three, four, five steps, which is still in the realm of doable but we're starting to get a little convoluted. There might be a faster way. But we at least found a pathway that would work. And we know that each of these is, are reactions that are well understood and that, that we've seen before and that would give us at least a decent yield probably. Probably the lowest yield step would be the Grignard reagent step, mostly because Grignard reagents are notoriously hard to work with. If we let that one stew a little bit, we could probably make it work. Wouldn't the, um, didn't you mention the formaldehyde? Wouldn't that only be four steps then? If you add then uh, like um, acetyl yeah, chloride? After that. If we did, yeah, if we did formaldehyde instead of the methyl iodide, that skips a couple steps. Formaldehyde is also kind of hard to work with because it doesn't actually exist as formaldehyde. So we draw it like this, but really it's not present. If it's in water, it's not really present. It's hard to actually make formaldehyde um, in a pure state. And so we would have water present as well, which means the magnesium bromide would be hard to, to work with. Um, in general, we try not to use formaldehyde as a reactant because it's really, really hard to get it in any, anything close to a pure state. What if in that first step you used like an alkyne as a nucleophile and then chop that off? That would reverse the, the pi bond to be on the left instead of the oxygen being on the left. But different way to look at it, maybe? And alkyne as a nucleophile is interesting because we could still go through an elimination addition reaction, potentially, to convert that bromine into, if we use an acetylide to displace the bromine, we could wind up, then we wind up adding two carbons instead of one. But then yeah, we could, 
in theory, go through ozonolysis, chop off the other one, turn it into a carboxylic acid, and then reduce the carboxylic acid. But wouldn't that put our pi bond too close to the benzene ring? Then we want the oxygen closer to the benzene ring? So, yes, but if we... If we started by taking this and we expose it to um, the acetylide and high temps, we could do the elimination addition potentially, and then we would get this, which then through ozonolysis, we could get the benzoic acid. which then we could reduce to the alcohol, excess lithium aluminum hydride. But I think that actually does cut off a step. Yeah. On here? Yeah, hey, you can watch it on TV. It's fine. Just turn down the volume if mom needs you to. All right. So then that gets us to the benzyl alcohol, which then we can expose to the, the acetate to make, make this. So that does that would cut off one step. It's a four-step synthesis instead of a five-step, which more fewer steps is usually better. Although the fact that we, you know, we don't know exactly what the efficiency would be like on these first two steps. So as far as actual yield, five. Five good steps might be better than four mediocre steps, but you guys are thinking the right the right way with these. How can we get around this? How can we turn it into? And now that now that we've actually thought about benzoic acid could be reduced to the benzyl alcohol, maybe there's a better way we could turn the bromine into the benzo benzoic acid potentially. Um, but so. We're out of time here, but you guys are thinking about this the right way. Um, I will, like I said, this is 20.32. Um, so if you wanted to, if you have the solutions manual, you can check on this. Um, give C a try over the weekend if you've got some spare time and feel like thinking about OCHEM, um, which is not everybody's cup of tea, especially right after a midterm. But like I said, the quiz will be easy. So give C a try on your own, and then we'll talk about B and C at the beginning of class on Tuesday. All right. Folks, have a good weekend, and I will see everybody then. Thanks, Sean. You too. Thank you, Sean. Thanks. Adios, amigo. <laughs>